some other some other uh, items that we do here. But I think starting next week. Now this is what what's the date today? This is uh, uh, the twenty second, March twenty second, Sunday, March twenty second. This is the eight thirty service. Uh, let's let's go ahead and uh, for the spring and the summer. Let's go ahead and move our 8.30 service and our 10 o'clock service. Let's move them together and just have a 10 o'clock service. That, that work for you? So if you still come at 8.30, come on. Uh, come hang out and cook me stuff. And I like bacon and sausage. Uh, so, uh, so we'll move. The, again, you're still welcome to come hang out if you want to. But uh, beginning next week then, we'll still have our Wednesday night Bible study at the same time, 6.30 here. And uh, the 8.30 service, especially those of you folks who are watching online, you get to sleep in just a little bit longer. Uh, we will move uh, the 8.30 and the 10 o'clock together. So we will just have, for the spring and summer at least, a 10 o'clock service. Okay, so mark that down. Uh, show up if you'd like. Uh, I may or may not be here. If I'm here at 8.30, I may be wearing my jammies and my chopos. <laughs> All right, so we'll start that next week. All right, shall we jump into this? We have a lot to cover, so hold on to your seat belts, or buckle your seat belts. Or, uh, I told Lauren, this is, this is not necessarily the last message I would preach if, if, if I knew that this was going to be the one. I, I'm not necessarily, necessarily saying that this is the message I would preach. But I think what I'm about to bring, you know, we're, we're, looking, at, we're, we're looking at when weakness wins. We're looking at when, uh, uh, when the faithful fail. Right. There are just some some themes that uh, that we just keep finding ourselves coming back to over and over and over. And and most people kind of miss it when I try to teach this, but not because they're unable, unable to hear it like I'm smarter and y'all are dumber. It's not that. But there's something about this topic that is just hard to hear. The flesh doesn't want to hear it. Satan doesn't want you to hear it. It's just hard to hear. So uh, let me start like this, okay? Does anyone like to be told that they're wrong? Any, anybody like to be? Yeah. <laughs> John, what are you eating? Nothing. You didn't eat anything. Yeah. John, look at mommy. Anything. Are you telling me the truth? Yeah. You didn't have any snacks? Nope. Let me see. You didn't have any snacks. Open wide. Let me see. Really? You didn't have any snacks? John, come here. Never good when Mama says, come here. John, can you explain to me why, why the sprinkles are empty? Well, they're not empty. John, look at me. Not did you eat those sprinkles? No. I did not. You know it's not nice to tell stories and to lie, right? Look at mommy. You're not supposed to lie. Tell me now. Did what you did eat you those sprinkles? No. I did not eat those sprinkles. John, mm -hmm. you have sprinkles on your face. Oh, um, no. No. <laughs> Oh, I did not eat the Wow. Does anyone like to be told that they're wrong? What if you are wrong? If, 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 uh, if you walk out of the bathroom and, you, and, you, and you're dragging a piece of paper on the bottom of your foot or guys forgot a zipper or got a shipwreck on Booger Reef or, you know, something. Do we want to be told? Would you, would you rather not have, you have pepper or a piece of, tortilla hanging out between your teeth after lunch? Would you rather somebody tell you or would you rather nobody tell you? If, if you're wrong, do you want anybody to tell you at all? I think you did it. Was it you? Did you, you tore this up? Yeah, it was. It was you. What is this? You know if there's a bad round off they did? Who's hiding behind here? Was this you? What a bad boy. How about you, mister? Did you destroy a pillow that wasn't yours? Were you bad? What have you done, Buck? Buck. Bad boy. And here's what Berlin did today. And when she was questioned about it, she's now holding out in the shower. She's praying that we <laughs> blame somebody else. Did you get on the counter and get those cookies, Libby? 
<laughs> What's wrong? What'd you do, Rousey? Did you get in the garbage? Yeah, come here. Who peed over here? <laughs> well, I guess that answers that. Look, we all have areas of weakness, huh? Proverbs chapter 9, verse 6 says, Stop being gullible. Start living. Start traveling on the road to understanding. Look, if, if someone is a scorner, if someone is very arrogant, if you try to correct an arrogant person, you're going to be abused. Whoever warns a wicked person might even get hurt. Verse 8, do not warn a mocker or he will hate you. Warn a wise person, though, and the wise person who receives correction will love you. Look, we all have areas of not just weakness, but wickedness. First John 1 John 1.8 says, we claim to be without sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. His word is not in us. So the truth is, sometimes we are wrong. But do we like to be told? I, I think most of us really don't. You know, I just as soon you let me know if I do have tortilla or chicken hanging out between my teeth after lunch. But I, I know we like to think, we, we, we would like to be corrected, and I, I, I would rather know that I'm doing the right thing. So yeah, let me know. Tell me, right? But you've tried to share truth with somebody. You, you've, you've tried to help them see the error of their way or, or how maybe they could do something better. Most people, I think you would agree, don't like to be told. They just don't. Um, what's next? Oh, when I tell somebody that they're wrong. Oh, my, one of my favorite things to do. Look back at Proverbs 9. You know, it's, it's my job, my self-appointed duty. No, I, this, is, this is what pastors do. Prophets, people, people who are given the privilege, the responsibility, and this, this is not just me, it's any of you who feel that responsibility to help people see what God has to say, right? It, it, this is not just about helping people feel better about themselves. This is about helping people actually be better, actually becoming more Christ-like. Well, to do that, you have to let them know where they're off course. You know, the Bible says that uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness to help them get on track, to keep, keep them moving down the track, to let them know when they've jumped the track, to get them back on the track, and then to help them keep moving down the track. When I tell somebody that they're wrong, Proverbs 9, verse 6, same thing happens to me that happens to anyone else. You tell people to stop being gullible, to start following God's word, travel the road to understanding, get on the God path. Verse 7, but when I correct an arrogant person, guess what happens? Well, they abuse me. Yeah, they're going to do the same to you. You tell someone who thinks they are all that, they think they, thinks they is all that. They, they think that they know more. They think they, didn't, they know more than you. A mocker thinks they know more than God. Whoever corrects a mocker will receive abuse from that person. If you warn a wicked person, they'll be so angry and upset, they're liable to start swinging, uh, definitely with words. They're going to say things to you. They will definitely say things about you. They'll say things behind your back because they can't admit that they are the wrong one. They're living in wickedness. I don't just mean sins that they're doing and we're not doing. I mean living a life that's apart from God. So don't worry about warning a mocker. But, but what if the mocker is your kid? What if it's someone in your family? What if it's someone you work with, someone you really care about? How can you not tell them? Well, they're going to hate you. But if you warn a wise person, they'll respect you. They'll appreciate you. The most important thing I will ever be able to tell you, you ready for this? <laughs> You're wrong about God. Most people don't like what I have to say. Most people don't, oh, tell me again. Oh, tell me again. Because most of my messages are telling you where you're wrong about God. Because I do want you to feel better, but I really want you to be better. And so it sounds like half the time I'm nagging about things that are unimportant, but it is my job. And if you're a believer, to tell you the truth, it's really your job as well. It's our job to tell people where they are wrong about God, not the similarities. It's not our job to tell Buddhists and Baptists what they have in common. 
It's not our job to, to help Catholics and, and Charismatics see where they agree. It's our job to tell people where they're wrong from where the Bible says they should be. Uh, not everything. You're not wrong about everything about God, just some things. Now, here's a big thing that I need to tell you. You ready for this? This is one of the, if, if, if I only had one message to teach, where we live in the desert southwest, huh? I would underscore this. I would circle it. I, if, if I could tattoo you, I would tattoo it on your forehead so you'd see it every time you look in the mirror. God hates religion. God, it sounds kind of crazy, doesn't it? God hates religion. And when I say that to people, especially in church, it goes right over their head. They have no idea. I had someone school me yesterday at the barn. Uh, we got into a little, little mini theological discussion telling me where I'm wrong, uh, where I'm wrong about what I'm teaching about the Bible. Because what he's been taught about his church will supersede what I've been taught that's in the Bible. I'm telling you, God hates religion. His, mine, yours, he hates religion. What the heck am I talking about? God hates whatever we've learned in Baptist churches, Lutheran, Methodist churches, Presbyterian churches. God hates whatever you learned in Catholic churches, charismatic churches, non-denominational churches. God hates whatever we've learned in any church that will keep us from trusting Him alone for the forgiveness of sin. Catholics and charismatics don't teach the same thing. Did you know that? Did you know Baptists and Buddhists don't believe the same thing? Methodists, Mormons, Muslims, did you know we don't all believe the same thing? Someone told me that as uh, Christians, we need to stick together. He meant, he's a Catholic, I'm a Christian. He's a Catholic, I'm a Baptist. We as Christians need to stick together. My response, I didn't say it out loud because that wasn't the place to say this, but my response inside was, yeah, let's, let's get along. You come to my side and we'll get along. But you want me to go to your side and get along. But he believes that the church and baptism and good works will help get you into heaven. I believe what the Bible says, that there's nothing you can do to get into heaven. You've just got to trust Jesus Christ alone. God hates whatever you've learned in any church that keeps you from trusting Him alone for the forgiveness of your sin. Look, God hates religion. Religion might preach grace, but another thing they practice, tend to ridicule God's people, they did it to John the Baptist. They can't fix their problems, and so they just mask it, not realizing religion's like spraying perfume on a casket. See, the problem with religion is it never gets to the core. It's just behavior modification, like a long list of chores. Like, let's dress up the outside, make it look nice and neat. But it's funny, that's what they used to do to mummies while the corpse rots underneath. Now I ain't judging, I'm just saying, quit putting on a fake look. Because there's a problem if people only know that you're a Christian by your Facebook. I mean, in every other aspect of life, you know that logic's unworthy. It's like saying you play for the Lakers just because you bought a jersey. See, this was me too, but no one seemed to be on to me. Acting like a church kid while addicted to pornography. See, on Sunday I'd go to church, but Saturday getting faded, acting if I was simply created to just have sex and get wasted. See, I spent my whole life building this facade of neatness, but now that I know Jesus, I boast in my weakness. Because if grace is water, then the church should be an ocean. It's not a museum for good people, it's a hospital for the broken. Which means I don't have to hide my failure, I don't have to hide my sin. Because it doesn't depend on me, it depends on Him. See, because when I was God's enemy, and certainly not a fan, He looked down and said, I want that man. Which is why Jesus hated religion, and for it He called them fools. Don't you see so much better than just following some rules? Now let me clarify. I love the church, I love the Bible, and yes, I believe in sin. But if Jesus came to your church, would they actually let him in? See, remember he was called a glutton and a drunkard by religious men. But the Son of God never supports self-righteousness, not now, not then. Now back to the point, one thing is vital to mention. How Jesus and religion are on opposite spectrums. See, one's the work of God, but one's a man-made invention. See, one is the cure, but the other's the infection. See, because religion says do, Jesus says done. Religion says slave, Jesus says son. God hates religion. Look, Aaron was Moses' brother. We're going to be looking at uh, the giving of the Ten Commandments, right? 
Aaron was Moses' older brother. Aaron was Moses' faithful helper. Uh, helper. Uh, Aaron was God's obedient follower. Aaron was God's faltering servant. Uh, we've been looking at when weakness wins. Aaron was a strong leader. He was a good guy. He was a great helper. He was a good servant to the Lord. But weakness won out in his life. As we're taking a quick look at, at Aaron's life this morning, I want you to see something that God is underscoring. God hates religion. You may not agree yet, but God hates religion. This is what you need to tell your loved ones. This is what you need to tell your uncles, your aunts, your cousins, your neighbors, your kids, your mom, your dad, your boss, your employees. God hates religion. Now, that's not just the point that God hates religion. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him, not religion, not a church, not baptism, God so loved the world that he gave, God so loved every single person in our lives that he gave his son Jesus so that anyone who believes and trusts in him alone could be forgiven, won't perish, but would receive eternal life. In Aaron, we see a strong warrior that became a weak, messed up sinner. God's people had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. God used Moses to persuade Pharaoh to release them. God is about to make his people Israel, the same people that we read about in the newspaper, same people that we see on the news, his people Israel. God was about to call them and make them his, his covenant people, his covered people, his set-apart consecrated people, his I love them more than you could imagine coveted people. God was about to give his people Israel a contract. This is the agreement I'm making with you. Exodus 24, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. Now, uh, Aaron is who? Moses what? Brother. Nadab and Abihu, those are Aaron's sons. This is a pretty privileged family. God said to Moses, Bring your brother Aaron and his two sons, Nadab and Abihu, and bring 70 of the elders of Israel. You were to worship at a distance, but Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near, and the people may not come up with him. So this is just before Charlton Heston goes up on Mount Sinai, okay? Uh, actually, he's already gone up, and, and he's, he's seen the Lord in the burning bush, and, and God has called him to, to come. and The people have been set free, and now they're, they, they've come out of Egypt. They're about to go into Canaan, in, about to go into the Promised Land. And God calls him over again and said, Mo, I want to talk to you. Bring your brother Aaron. Bring the boys. Uh, I'm going to talk to you. So Moses, Aaron, Nad, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up. They saw the God of Israel. Under, his, under God's feet was something like pavement, but it was made of, of, of lapis lazuli, some sort of brilliant uh, uh, gem. It was as bright and blue as the sky. Verse 12, the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here. I will give you the tablets of stone with the new commandments that I have written for their instruction. Uh, with the law and the commandments that I have written for their instruction. 13, Moses set out with Joshua, his assistant, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. But Moses said to the elders, you wait here until we come back uh, to you. Aaron and her are with you. And if anyone has a problem, they can go to Aaron, they can go to her. But Joshua and I are going to go up on the mountain to meet with God. Verse 15, Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. Verse 18, Moses stayed on the mountain 40 days, 40 nights. Aaron was a good leader uh, when he had a good leader. Aaron was strong when he was following someone who was strong. Aaron was pretty amazing as long as he was following someone who was pretty amazing. Uh, maybe you know people like that. They're good people if they're following good people. You know what I mean? As long as they're hanging out with the right crowd, they're, they're pretty good people. But they get together with the wrong person, and they end up following down that path. Aaron was like that. He was strong in some areas, but he was weak in other areas. He was a good leader if he had a good leader. But now, just a few days after seeing God, Aaron saw God. Aaron heard God. The Bible goes out of its way to say, and they didn't die. They weren't killed. I mean, they saw God. And just a few days after seeing the one true God, Aaron's going to be pressured into doing something so stupid. Aaron is going to find out that God 
hates religion. Aaron's going to do an amazingly religious thing. And everybody ought to say, well, he believes in God. He loves God. He did a thing for God. And God said, what you're doing is wrong. Aaron's pressured into doing something that's really going to make God mad. Continue in verse, uh, chapter 32. Um, actually, where was I? I was in Exodus 24. Now I'm jumping all the way to Exodus 32. All right? Moses has gone up. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he leaves Aaron and her and the 70 elders, Nadab and Abihu. Moses and Joshua go up a little higher on the mountain. He leaves Joshua, it appears, and he goes farther uh, up the mountain and he talks with God. Okay? Exodus 32. 40, 40 days after Exodus 24 that I just read. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and they said, Come make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, as for this fellow Moses, as for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Verse 2, Aaron answered them, Well, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and they brought them to Aaron. Does it sound like they put a gun to Aaron's head? Does it sound like they threatened to burn his house down, his wife, his kids, and kill his goats? And All right, bring all your gold to me. Verse 4, Aaron took what they had handed him and he made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf. Where did he get that idea? How, how old is Aaron at this point? How old is Moses? When, when Moses came out of uh, Egypt, I think when he was running for his life, wasn't he about 40 years old? He had grown up in the ways of Egypt. He killed an Egyptian defending a Hebrew. He wandered in the wilderness for how many years? 40 years. So he's back now about to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. So he's about 80 years old. Uh, remember when Moses was a baby and put in the little basket and put in the Nile River, uh, he already had an older brother. Who was that? Uh, Aaron. So how old was Aaron? Well, older than 80, yeah? I mean, he's probably as old as dirt, as old as dad, probably. Yeah. Actually, Moses was about as old as dad, yeah? So Aaron would have been a little bit, a little bit older than that. Where was I? Uh, verse uh, 4. So, I asked the question, where, where, where would Aaron get this idea? Where did Aaron grow up? He grew up in Egypt. They'd been slaves for 400 years. Aaron was 80-some years old, 84, 5, 6, 7, 90 years old. Aaron was a little older than Moses. All he'd ever known was what God had, 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 had told them, which was very, very little during those 400 years of bondage. They had some of God's word, but mostly they were surrounded by pagan culture. They were surrounded by the religion of the Egyptians, the pagan gods that the Egyptians had made up because they turned away from the true God. That's all Aaron had seen. He knew the truth because his mother told him, his father told him. They knew the truth because their parents told them. They knew the truth because their parents told them. But in spite of the fact that they'd been told the truth, they lived in it wasn't their choice, but they lived in this area where there was nothing but pagan religion. And when pressured, you know what came out of Aaron? That pagan religion. He took what they handed them, and he made it into an idol in the shape of a calf, fashioned it with a tool. Didn't happen accidentally. He, 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 he machined it himself. Then they said, then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Who had just brought him out of Egypt? The one true God, Yahweh, Jehovah, using Moses, that, you know, that, that dude, whoever he is, that, that, that Moses guy. These are your gods. Look at this picture. These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Um, it's been found in, 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 uh, uh, in, a, in a Phoenician, uh, I think Ashkelon, one of the Phoenician cities, uh, statues of, of uh, calves. Uh, they were made of bronze and, and other materials. But the calf was worshipped, uh, worshipped. A, a, baby, a, a, a baby bull, a calf, was worshipped by the Egyptians, by the, the, the Canaanites, by many others. 
uh, yet another one of the fertility gods. Why would Aaron make one of those? Did he think he was doing something bad? Did he think that God was going to beat him up and kill him and yell at him? Yeah. So would you think it, go back, go back a sec. Do you think it'd be okay to make one of those? Now, you know the rest of the story. Does Aaron get in trouble for making this or does God commend him? What happens? Talk to me. Was it good or bad? It was bad. Okay. How about the next one? Remember the story of uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Uh, Daniel uh, and, the, and, and teenagers from Israel, this is years later, had been kidnapped, taken away to, uh, the, to Babylon, to Babylonia, to, to uh, Iraq today. Um, and they're forced to take on the ways of the Babylonians. One of the things they were forced to do was to worship the Babylonian gods. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image to himself. I think it was some 90 feet tall, a 90-foot statue. He made a statue to himself, and he forced everybody to bow down to it. And remember, did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bow down? They didn't do it. Why not? Because they knew it was wrong. So is it okay to make an image like that? Of Nebuchadnezzar? Is it good or bad? Bad. Okay. What about the next one? The Phoenicians, the Canaanites, we've read about these guys. Uh, there you go. Uh, they made gods that were basically wood stoves with heads. They'd fire the thing up, and they would take babies and sacrifice them alive into the fire. The belly of their god was a burning fire. Again, basically a wood stove with a head, and they sacrificed their babies. What did God say about that? Well, it, they believe in God. They're being religious. They go to church. Good or bad? Okay. What about a skinny Buddha? Is it okay to make an image of a skinny Buddha? Did you ever see an image of a skinny Buddha? Uh, the other Buddha that uh, we're used to, it looks a little familiar, so familiar I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> what? Is it okay to have a chubby Buddha on your dresser? Uh, we would say no, right? Well, why is it? that some people would say that this one's okay. I've had people tell me that they're not coming to the barn, the burrito barn, because they heard that we broke a statue of Mary here. And we did. Because it was just a statue to make a point. And the point was made. But rather than recognizing, oh, I'm supposed to worship the true God, Many people, many people, not just one, many people have decided, I, I don't want to have anything to do with a place like that. They liked coming here. They liked what was going on. But when reminded that God hates religion, God hates religious things, God hates statues. If I, if I had taken a Buddha and broken it, oh, what a waste. If I had taken a statue of Krishna or a, or a statue of, of a Phoenician god, uh, Lauren pointed out, was it Wednesday night, that what ISIS is doing in many of the Babylonian museums, many of the Iraqi museums that they're going into, they're destroying uh, uh, thousand-year-old uh, pieces of art. And, and I feel like, Lauren, I'm a little conflicted about it because, I mean, that's history. That they're, they're just destroying it uh, like any uh, uh, warring conqueror. They go in and they destroy uh, the nation that they're subjugating. They destroy their history. They burn their books. They destroy their history. They, they burn everything in the museums. Uh, that's, that's a tragedy. But what, they're, what ISIS is destroying are uh, statues, images that were made to other gods. So I get that. God said, do that. But why is it uncomfortable to say that it's wrong to have a statue of Mary? What about the next one? Is it okay to, is it okay to have a statue of Jesus? Are they the same? You want to go back a couple? A little more, a little more, a little more. Is that one okay? Yes or no? No. Next, forward. Oh, that one. Is that one okay? We know God said no. That's not okay. Uh, go forward. Not okay. Not okay. Not okay. Oh, why? Why? Next one. Okay. I just, I just want to remind you, God hates religion. God wants us to be consistent, not just with the way we grew up. He wants us to be consistent with what he says. Back to Exodus, verse 2, Aaron answered them, 
Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, your daughters are wearing. Bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings, brought them to Aaron. He took what they had handed him, and he made a statue in the shape of a calf. He made it with tools. Then he said, these are your gods. They said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar. He didn't just say, oh, I did a horrible thing. He built an altar for this idol. And he announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people got up early. How many people get up early to go to church here? Well, this many. Cool. A whole lot of people got up early to go to that festival. You'll see why in a minute. So the next day, the people rose early, sacrificed burnt offerings, and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink. And then they got up to indulge in revelry. Uh, depending on what version you're reading, you get the idea. It's basically drinking, dancing, and I need a D word for orgy. Drinking, you read in the other passages, they were drinking, getting drunk, they were dancing, and they were indulging in sexual orgies. That's how they were, that's how they were worshiping God in front of the golden calf. Good or bad? I mean, does God think it's good or bad? Thank you very much. Now, it's so easy to see, isn't it? It's so easy to see. I think it's easy to see. The next day they got up and they just turned away from God. Verse 15, Moses turned and he went down the mountain with the, the two tablets and the, uh, of the covenant of the law in his hands. And they were inscribed on both sides of the stone front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Moses got to Joshua. Joshua and Moses coming down. Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, and he said to Moses, there's a sound of war in the camp. Moses replied, this is not the sound of victory. This is the sound of defeat. Oh, it is not the sound of victory. It is not the sound of defeat. It is the sound of singing that I hear. Now, that sounds good. People singing in church, that's, that's worship. That, that's a good thing. Evidently, it wasn't a good thing. When Moses approached the camp, singing in church is okay. It's what they were doing. It's what they were singing about. It's why they were doing it. When Moses approached the camp in verse 19, and he saw the statue, would Buddha have been okay? Would Nebuchadnezzar have been okay? Would the Phoenician god no been okay? The statue of Mary or the statue of Jesus, would those have been okay? When Moses saw the image of the calf and the dancing, his ang I didn't put that in, by the way. That's what the Bible says. Why were they dancing? Well, because they were happy and drunk. His anger burned, and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And then Moses took, he took the statue. He took, the, it was a religious statue. It, it was like, it was like the statue of the Virgin Mary. Oh, no, it wasn't. It, it was a calf. It was a, it was a bull. So it wasn't the same. But I would ask, why wasn't it the same? I think it's the same. He took the calf that the people had made. He burned it in the fire. He ground it to powder. He scattered it on the water, and he made the Israelites drink it. He said to Aaron, dude, bro, what did they do to you? How did they force you to lead them into such great sin? They were worshiping, they were singing, they were dancing, they were happy together. They were indulging in great sin. My bad, Aaron said, don't, don't be mad. You know how prone these people are to evil. You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. That's what they said about you, Mo. 24, so I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. They gave me the gold. I threw it into the fire, and the calf jumped out. That's what he said. I just threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. I don't know. 25, Moses saw the people were running wild. What were they doing that was running wild? I mean, what does this say they were doing? Singing, dancing, drinking, and involved in revelry. Again, the, the debauchery. Moses saw the people were running wild, that Aaron had let them get out of control, and so became a laughingstock of their enemies. 
The Bible says that when we live ungodly lives, it causes unbelievers, people who hate God, to say bad things about God. Because we're no different than they are. So we stood at the entrance of the camp. Okay, whatever we think about it, I think we would agree, God thinks this was a bad thing, right? So most of us really don't like to be told that we're doing something bad. We sure don't like to be told that the way we're worshiping God is bad. Who are you to judge me, Junior Holy Spirit? Tony. I've been called Junior Holy Spirit on more than one occasion. Nobody likes to be told. And nobody likes to be told that the way they're worshiping God is wrong. It's a personal thing. It's a private thing. I'll worship God the way I worship God, and you worship God the way you worship God. Listen to what Moses did. He didn't just break the statue of Mary. He didn't just break their religious statue. He stood at the entrance of the camp, and he said, All right, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And of the 2 million or 6 million, 2 to 6 million people, of the, the millions of people who came out of Egypt... All the Levites rallied to him. The Levites were just the priests, not the Catholic priests. These, these were the, the religious leaders that, that were from the tribe of Levi, the family of Levi, that God had told Moses to, to uh, install, to establish as, as the religious leaders. Who's for the Lord? Only the religious leaders that had been set apart came over to Moses' side. Moses said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Moses didn't make this up. This is what God said. Strap a sword to your side. Go home, get your pistolas. Go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other. Look at what it says. Go from one end of the camp, killing your brother and your friend and your neighbor. 28. The Levites did as Moses commanded. And that day, how many died? 3,000 people were killed by the sword. What did they do wrong? They believed in God. They were worshiping. They were singing. They were dancing around the altar. I, I mean, that they had given a big offering. They had given their, their earrings and their bracelets and their, and their gold watch bands. And their, I mean, they were worshiping God. Look, I, I believe it. They believe in God. You, you think everybody has to do it your way, Tony? No, everybody has to do it God's way. Because if you don't, it's the wrong way. If there's only one thing I could just, just, just scratch into our hearts, if there's only one thing I could just, just get into your head and get into your heart so that you could go out of your way to get into everybody's head and heart that you care about, it's that God hates religion. Religion blinds people. Religion binds people. Eventually, religion grinds people. That's what happened to Samson. And that's what's going to happen to everybody who's following a false god. Everyone who's following the true god the wrong way. These guys are following the true god. I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just familiar with the statues that I grew up with. I'm familiar with the religion that I grew up with. I'm comfortable with that. That's what got Israel in trouble. That's all they knew. I mean, you're only 20, 30 years old. These guys had been around that for 80 years. They'd been around it for 400 years. God knows how easy it is for us to fall into the familiar. He knows how easy it is for us to start worshiping the way we've been taught, doing the God things the way we've been told we're supposed to do the God things. God hates religion. He wants us to go His way, not their way. Moses told him, put on your sword, kill everybody who's worshiping the calf. Kill everybody who's worshiping the true God the wrong way. Evidently, a lot of them stopped the revelry. They stopped the dancing. They stopped the partying. But a lot of them didn't stop. At least 3,000 of them were killed that day. Now, who were these guys killing? Strangers? Some in their own family that were worshiping the right God the wrong way. Brothers got killed. Fathers, sons, neighbors, cousins. 27, go back and forth through the camp. From, that's horrible, isn't it? What a mean God. How horrible is sin? How horrible is disobedience? How horrible is religion? 
Religion pulls people away from a true relationship with God. Go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother, friend, and neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded. That day about 3,000 people died. Then Moses said, you have been set apart to the Lord today, for you were against your own sons and brothers, and he has blessed you this day. How, how did they get blessed? Do you feel blessed when you lose a loved one to death? Death takes someone you love, you care about. Do you feel blessed? Not only that, they killed their loved ones because they were worshiping God the wrong way. How are they blessed? It may not seem like it, may not have feel, felt like it. They were blessed because they were separated for God. God wants you to be blessed. You know how? He wants you to be separated for God. Verse 30, the next day Moses said to the people, you've committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord and perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Moses went back to the Lord and he said, oh, what a great sin these people have committed that they've made themselves gods of gold, 35. And in addition to killing the 3,000 people, the Lord struck the people with a plague because of what they did with the calf that Aaron had made. If it wasn't enough that 3,000 of them were killed with a sword, God struck them down with more disease and more disease and more sickness and more illness. Look, God hates religion. Exodus 20, verses 1 through 5. God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So the golden calf, was that another god? Yeah. Yeah. The, the Phoenician gods, the wood stove with the head, is that another god? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the image of Nebuchadnezzar, was that another god? Uh, yeah. The statue of Mary or Jesus, is that another god? Why do we say no? I don't mean you're saying no. I'm saying in our head, in our hearts. Why do we say, oh, no, that's not the same? Why not? He didn't say what statues, did he? I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Verse 3, you shall have no other, no other gods before me. What exactly do you mean, one true God? Verse 4, let me, let me be clear about this. Don't make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. So I, so I can't make an origami bird out of paper? I, I can't make a statue of a duck? I can't have a pink flamingo in my front yard? What is the point here? Creativity and art? The point here is false worship. Don't make anything to worship. I, I don't worship Mary. I venerate her. Uh, same thing. I, I, don't, I don't worship the statues. They help me worship the true God. Hmm. Don't make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Verse 5, and if that's not clear enough, do not bow down to them. Do not worship them. Have you ever seen anyone bow down to a statue of Jesus? Uh, didn't we in Catholic Church? We always did. We genuflected. I didn't know what that was till I was a Baptist. I didn't know I was genuflecting. I did not. That's when you do the little kneely thing and you, yeah. We bowed down to a statue of Jesus. We bowed down to statues of Mary. Don't bow down to them. Don't worship them because I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God and I will punish you for worshiping false gods. God hates religion. Deuteronomy 12. Every abominable act which the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. They were sacrificing babies. Isaiah, I've had enough of burnt offerings. Br bring your worthless offerings no longer. I hate when you worship at the new moon festivals. I hate when you worship at your appointed feasts. They've become a burden to me. Have you ever been invited to something that you really didn't want to go to? A shower, a party, a wedding, a, you know, a get together. And you, oh, I don't want to go. God says, I don't want you to invite me to your religious services anymore. You have become a burden to me. Wow, God doesn't like going to church. No, he doesn't like going to worship that's wrong. Even when they were worshiping the right God the wrong way. I hate your festivals. I hate your feasts. They become a burden to me. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, when you say, oh, God, 
when we get together in citywide prayer meetings and Catholics and Charismatics and Baptists and Buddhists and Muslims and Methodists, they all get together downtown and they all pray. It's a, it's a joint prayer service, a non-denominational prayer service. Isn't that wonderful? We just all get together. You know what God says? When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. I will not listen. God hates religion. Now, if I'm going to show up at a non-denominational prayer service and preach the gospel to them, you think they'd love that? They would say, hey, we just need to get along. Okay, well, come to my side, we'll get along. But they want us to go to their side or stay on the wrong side. You can't, guys. You can't. You can't be God's friend and be fighting against God with your religion. You can't. God hates religion. Baptistism, there's no such thing, but if, if, if you think being a Baptist is all that or, or being a Catholic or charismatic, or, it's not about religion. Amos chapter 5, I hate, I reject your festivals. I don't delight in your solemn assemblies. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of your harps. Acts 4.12, this is why. Religion teaches that there are many ways to God. Religion teaches that there are other ways to God. Religion teaches the exact opposite of Acts chapter 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we, whereby we must be saved. There's only one way to be saved, and that's through whom? Jesus. Not through the Catholic Church, not through the Baptist Church, not through the Pope, not through Billy Graham, not through me, not through baptism, not through being good. Galatians 1.8. Well, what if an angel came to tell me that it's okay? Even if an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, Jesus dead, buried, and resurrected. That's the gospel. If, even if an angel from heaven, if he comes and preaches another gospel than the one we preach to you, let him be under God's curse. As we've already said, and now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. I'm not trying to win your approval, Paul says. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to get you to like me. I, I'm not trying to please people. Man, if I was still trying to please people, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. I, I would love for you to like me, but I'd rather for God to be pleased with me. And I got to tell you guys, I'm telling you, I'm preaching to the choir and I'm telling you, God hates religion. He hates it. He hates religion. He hates the statues. He hates the superstition. He hates anything that lets you think that your relatives, your loved ones, your neighbors, your boss, your employees... Anybody in your life, God hates anything that convinces you that they'll get there somehow. God hates religion. Aaron knew the truth, and he turned away from it. What happened to Aaron? He was pressured into preaching the wrong gospel. Aaron was pressured into preaching the wrong gospel. Aaron was pressured into, you would never preach the wrong gospel, would you? You would never preach a, 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 a falsehood. You would never preach a false gospel. Aaron did, and he knew the truth. Real quick. The way to God has no rituals. The way to God has no statues. The way to God has no superstitions at all. The gospel that leads people to God is not fake. <laughs> looks cute looks harmless that probably is religion dresses up like that religion persuades you that it's safe it's okay it's acceptable it's uh you know it, 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 we, we, we can we can we can we can go along to get along you don't have to fight against all the religions but I'm telling you at some point, you need to proclaim loudly, as strongly as you can, that the gospel that leads people to God is not a fake gospel. And there are fake gospels. They look harmless, but they're not. The gospel that leads people to God is not fake. 
It's not fake with rituals, a bunch of rules, a bunch of laws. Do this and you can be saved. Don't do that and you can get to heaven. None of those rules, none of those, those rituals, those statutes will get you to heaven. And none of those statues will get you to heaven. Not Jude, not Pete, not Mary, not statues of Jesus. They will not get you to God. Not the crucifix, the cross with Jesus hanging on it. None of those things are going to get you to heaven. No rituals, no statues, no superstitions. Acts 17. Paul was in Athens, Greece, the Apostle Paul. And as he was walking through Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of religious statues. I mean, talk about a religious city. These guys have statues to gods everywhere. That should be a good thing, right? Well, they believe in God. They're worshiping God. Paul was distressed to see that the city was so religious. 17. So he went to the synagogue, and he reasoned both with Jews and, and God-fearing Gentiles, the Greeks, as well as in the marketplace. He, he went out there in the parking lot at Walmart, and he started preaching every day with anybody who happened to be there. Well, a group of, uh, of uh, very sophisticated Epicureans and Stoic philosophers, I mean, kind of extremes here, people who really indulged themselves and people who really sacrificed, they began to debate with Paul. Some of them asked, well, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, oh, he's advocating foreign gods. Because he kept talking about this god Anastasia. He wasn't talking about a god Anastasia. Paul was referring to Anastasia, which means the resurrection. Paul was preaching the resurrection, 18. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the Anastasia, the resurrection. Then they took Paul. They, they brought him to the meeting place of the Areopagus where they said to him, uh, tell us more. We want to know more about this new teaching that you're presenting. Paul stood up at the meeting and he said, people of Athens, I can see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even followed an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship. He didn't commend them for being religious. He didn't say, these are the most beautiful works of art I have ever seen. I wouldn't go to the Sistine Chapel. Personally, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go to Mormon temples to look at the, the beautiful art and, the, and the, the architectural design. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go through Rome and look at the beautiful cathedrals. I wouldn't because they're dedicated to false gods. I wouldn't or the true God, and they're worshiping the, the true God the wrong way, I wouldn't. You're ignorant of the very things that you worship. This is what I am going to uh, proclaim to you. Verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, He's the Lord of heaven and earth, and He doesn't live in temples built by human hands. Paul appealed to the God who was before all the other made-up gods, the God who was first in line, the God who was before anything. And he's not served by human hands in 25. He doesn't need anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this. God gave restrictions so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. 28. For in the one true God, the one who was first, in Him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are His offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that... <coughs> Excuse me. We should not think that the divine being... <coughs> we should not think that God is like gold or silver or stone or any image, statue, made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now you ought to know better. Now He commands people everywhere to repent, not to worship the statues, not to worship the religion that encourages that kind of worship, but to repent to the one true God. God has set a day when He will judge the world with justice by the one man He has appointed. And He has given proof of this to everyone by raising that one man, Jesus, from the dead. When they heard about Jesus being raised up from the dead, some of them sneered. They were mockers. Yeah, whatever. 
They said, you know, we'll, we'll listen to you another time, Paul. We, you know, another time we'll talk about this. Well, at that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul, and they believed the gospel. The God who was first, uh, the God before any of the other gods, he's the only way to heaven. The God who was first is the only God. Look, we want to be sure that we're not preaching a false message. Now you're a cat. Yeah. What do people hear? Kitty cat? Do they hear woof, woof, bow, wow, wow? Kitty cat, you're supposed to say meow, meow, meow. Child of God, follower of Jesus Christ. The only thing coming out of our lips ought to be Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus is the only way to salvation. Not the Catholic Church, not a Baptist Church, not baptism not being good, not turning over a new leaf, not giving money to the church, not being good in the church, not doing good things in the church. There's only one way to get to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. There's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. Not the Catholic way, not the Baptist way, God's way. God hates religion. He hates religion. God hates religion. God hates religion. Religion is anything that keeps you from following the one true God. Religion is anything that persuades you that people can get to heaven any other way except through Jesus Christ. Oh, they believe in Jesus. The devils believe and tremble. To believe in Jesus Christ means you place your absolute faith and trust in Him. It means you say, I'm renouncing every other way to heaven. I'm not trusting my church. I'm not trusting my baptism. I'm not trusting anything else. I go to church. I've been baptized. I was baptized when I was a baby. I was baptized when I'm old. I go to church. I give in the offering. I bring stuff. I do stuff. I'm nice to people. I don't kick dogs. I pet kitties. I'm a good guy. But I believe that if I get to heaven, if, he says, you can know, I believe that if I get to heaven, it's going to be only because I'm trusting the Lord Jesus Christ who lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for my sins. He was buried and he rose from the dead. You can't get to God by being religious. You got to get saved. When did you get saved? When did you give your life to Jesus Christ? Were you at home? Were you in the hospital? Were you flat on your back? Were you kneeling down at an altar? Were you driving down the freeway? Where were you when you said, Jesus, I give up. I'm giving up everything. Jesus, I'm giving up. I'm trusting you and you alone. Jesus, please forgive me. Jesus, please save me. Jesus, please forgive me. Please, Jesus. You're my only hope. Church is okay. Baptism's fine. Giving money, doing stuff, all that's great. But don't do anything that God says don't do. Don't worship false gods. Don't worship the true God the wrong way. Give your life to Jesus. He wants us to get saved. Then he wants us to get soaked. Then he wants us to be serious about living for him. When did you give your life to Jesus? I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. And as I do, I, I, hope, I hope you understand that I'm not saying I hate church. Don't come to church because a lot of you guys you guys, people who are watching, people listening, people who would come to church might hear me say, oh, well, isn't going to church religious? Isn't going to church part of our religion? Fine. If, if, if you really think that's what I was saying, and I still missed it. And then if I only had one more sermon, I'd have to preach the same thing. God hates religion. Of course he doesn't hate the church. Of course he doesn't hate what we do for the Lord. Of course he doesn't hate what we do for each other. I know because he tells me all through the New Testament that I'm supposed to keep meeting together with you and not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And, and I'm supposed to exercise my spiritual gifts to, to, to help you grow in the faith. And you are too, to help us become more and more like Jesus. Until he comes again, we're supposed to gather together and encourage each other and do good works for God, do good works to encourage each other, do good works to encourage the world to come closer to Jesus. Not random acts of kindness. 
not a bunch of stuff that just makes people feel better. Preach the true gospel so they can actually be better, so they can be saved. Get them saved. Get them soaked. Get them serious. Of course, come to church. Starting next week, we're moving our 8.30 service and our 10 o'clock service to 10 o'clock. Starting next week. 8.30 and 10 o'clock. You can come at 8.30. I'll be here. I'll wave at you. We'll eat pancakes together if you, if you bring them. 8.30 and 10 o'clock, we're moving together. So beginning next week for the spring and summer, we'll have one service at 10 o'clock, okay? Y'all come. Bring people with you. Come and enjoy it. And, uh, we're, we're, and for the spring and summer, uh, we're going to forego our, our, uh, our cafe as well. We may have some goodies. We may have treats. I appreciate what the guys have done for the last six years. My goodness, ladies, guys who have worked so hard in the cafe, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Man. When Lauren and I first started, a couple of you guys were here at the beginning. Uh, we had a little table set up over here with a couple of loaves of rainbow bread. And I don't know why I get choked up thinking about this. A couple of packs of Oscar Mayer lunch meat, a bag of Lay's potato chips, and a head of lettuce. I can see it all now right over here. And we had church. We set up 40 little chairs, those cold steel chairs. Oh, my monkey, they were cold. Uh, as I recall, we might have set up heaters, those construction blow heaters. It was colder than a monkey, as I recall. Cold metal chairs. And, and we just did a little, little Bible study, a little church service. Had about 40 people in that morning. And then we just hung out over here and we had sandwiches. That was pretty cool. That was pretty neat. God's done a lot since then. Let's see what he does next. Let's kind of reposition ourselves. We've repositioned ourselves at the barn. It's about time to reposition ourselves here so that we can regroup and ask, God, what would you have me do? God, what do you want me to do? So the 8.30 service, 10 o'clock service, we're making the one 10 o'clock service. We're going to forego the cafe after the services for a while. Uh, again, we may have treats or goodies, but just come and just come and let's just focus on God. Let's focus on God's word. Let's focus on coming closer and closer to Him. Is that okay? Let's pray. Our Father, You know our hearts. You know we love You. You know the people here. They love You. They want to serve You. They're here. God, I pray that You would just pour blessings out on the people who are here this morning. God, just dump Your glory, Your goodness. Pour Your blessing, Your fulfillment, your, the, the sense of Your presence into their lives. God, bring us back to the place where we remember what it is, not just to, to, to do religious things or, or just show up here at church, but to really come hungry to hear from you, to find out what you say in your word and, and to anxiously get after it and want to do it. God, I'm so grateful for everyone here and I'm so grateful for everyone who serves. I'm so grateful for everyone who, who jumps in and gets in the fray. They get in the fight. But God, you know what you're doing with us. You, re, you restructure, you, you reposition us, you reshape us to make us more effective for you. God, help us get our minds off the junk that distracts us from the one true mission we have, to reach people for you and then to help them become more like you. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving us. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. Thank you, Jesus, for paying the price for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for letting me serve you. Help me find out what you really, really love and help me do that. Help me find out from your word what you really, really hate and help me stay away from that. Jesus, I love you. Please forgive me. Please change me. Please use me. God, bring glory to yourself through my life. I pray in your name. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for coming. We do have cafe today, so make yourself at home. Inside of me